Welcome back, everybody. Welcome back to Raven Online Community Church. Once again, I'm Pastor Sam Krogan, Associate Pastor. And uh, we've been gone for the last couple weeks because we just got over our annual Mardi Gras outreach where we had an incredible time uh, going out to the streets and ministering the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, have, seeing many people make decisions for Christ, seeing many people having their lives changed because we had over or somewhere between three and four hundred people that came in for the outreach and it was just incredible. It was awesome. But now we're getting back on track. Um, when we started this seminar, um, I guess but it was about five weeks ago, um, six weeks ago now because we missed last week. But five weeks ago, we started the class with the first two classes talking about the state of the church. And then for the next three classes, we talked about submission. And today we're going to be discussing one of the topics that is related to, or in many cases blamed for, a very high percentage of the divorces in the world today. Uh, this is a topic that is attributed to the cause of many marriages breaking up, both inside and outside of the church. And today we're going to be talking about the other S word. Yes, folks, we are going to be talking about sex today. But more than that, we're going to be talking about sex and intimacy. And because we don't usually think about what's right and wrong in God's eyes before we become Christians, sex is usually something that we don't talk about after we become a Christian. We often uh, think talking about sex is something that's off limits before we're or after we're saved uh, it's something that's off limits it's something that should not be discussed it's something that's that's a, a taboo I guess so to speak and that's just simply not true uh, regardless of whether you were raised in church or whether you became a Christian after you were married Many of you out there today have had questions about what God's thoughts were on sex and what we're supposed to do with it once we're saved. Um, you know, many of you thought about what are the do's, what are the don'ts when it comes to sex now that we're saved. Um, some of you that are out there today have actually gone to somebody and you've asked questions about it, seeking answers, but many of you out there have not. And because I'm discussing this in a class setting with people that are all around this world from different backgrounds, from different understandings, from different uh, religious standpoints, um, as opposed to individuals uh, across the table from one another, we're going to have people with varying different experiences that may run from no experience at all to being married 10 20, 30, maybe even 40 or 50 years that are that are listening to this today. And some of you that are here in this class may even think, you know what, I don't belong in this class. I don't, I don't need this. I don't need to listen to this. Or for whatever reason, you may be thinking that this doesn't apply to your relationship. Well, that's just simply not true either. Whether you're about to be married or whether you're married and have consummated your relationship, whether you've just gotten married and just consummated your marriage recently or whether you've been married for years and, and have, have, have had much experience in the area of sex and intimacy in your relationship, this class is going to apply to you. Please, please know that this class, as we go through it, it's not intended to make you squirm. It's not intended to make you blush. It's not intended to make you feel uncomfortable. And it's not going to be too explicit, okay? However, it will get somewhat explicit. So if you have little children out there that are running around while you're listening to it, you might want to make sure that they're not in earshot of this recording while you're listening. Okay, you're going to find that this class is about more than just sex. It's about God's intention behind the physical act and what we should know about it. It's more about the intimacy that's associated with intercourse rather than intercourse itself. It's also intended to maybe answer some questions or set your mind at ease about what it's all about, what God thinks about it, what it's intended for. And with that said, the first thing that you need to realize when it comes to your sexual relationship with your spouse is that spiritual intimacy more so than sexual intimacy is the number one priority 
in the marriage relationship. Okay, if if you're if you're just basing your relationship about a touchy feely kind of of uh, sexual experience, then then you're looking at it in the wrong way. When a couple's spiritual relationship, you know, the spiritual intimacy has always got to be that number one thing. Because when a couple's spiritual relationship is right, then their sexual relationship will be right. And this attitude that develops as a result of the proper spiritual relationship will spill over into the sexual relationship as well as other areas of their relationship and in your life in general. Because we're talking about an attitude about what God sees as the importance of sex in your relationship and not what man, or more, more specifically, what you think uh, the role of sex is in your relationship. Notice I said that the spiritual, okay, the spiritual makes the sexual right, not the sexual makes the spiritual right. Because if you're trying to build your relationship based solely or more specifically, mainly on the sexual aspect of your relationship, then what you're really doing, folks, is you're setting yourself up for failure. Because let's be honest, okay, the, the sexual relationship, the physical relationship, isn't always going to go right, okay? And because of that, you need to focus on the spiritual and then once the, the spiritual is right, once you've got the spiritual aspect of your relationship that you guys are seeking God together, you're seeking out God's will for your relationship together, you're seeking out God's will for your sexual relationship together, once you've got that spiritual relationship right, then the physical will just begin to fall in line. Okay, it's, it's sort of like the domino effect. You know, once you hit one domino, they all begin to fall over in line, in succession. You know, they just keep going down the line. Well, this is very similar. Once your spiritual relationship is right, you know, you're just like the domino effect, your physical relationship will begin to fall in line with the spiritual. Now, I'm not going to stand here and begin to deny that a good night in bed doesn't help the next morning get off to a good start. Everybody realizes that. Everybody understands that. When you have a good night in bed, for some reason, it releases all the frustrations. It, it, it begins to comfort. It, it, it just starts the next day off right. But there's something important that needs to be remembered here, and that there is more to sexual intimacy than just the physical act of intercourse. Okay? The physical act only adds another dimension to the spiritual part, the sexual intimacy part of your relationship, okay? Spiritual intimacy has got to come first in order to be able to overflow into the sexual intimacy part. Without the spiritual intimacy, it's just a hollow act, okay? It's just a hollow act that you perform. It's just, it's just something that's done in order that, you know, it's just another part of marriage, so to speak. Okay, but without spiritual intimacy, any satisfaction that you may have will feel hollow instead of hollow. Okay, it's going to feel hollow, H O L L O W, rather than hollow, H A L L O W. Okay, there will be times in your relationship when your relationship, the, the, the physical part of it, the physical aspect of your relationship, alone will not satisfy okay and this can tend to happen this tends to happen you know after you've been married for a while you know after you've been married for several years and without the spiritual intimacy the physical can seem to become stale and unsatisfying it could become hollow become empty it becomes you know just another thing to do okay it has no meaning it has no satisfaction instead of being hollow, something that's reverent. Since God is a, 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 is a God, since sex, let me try this again. Since sex is a God-given gift to a man and a woman that have been united in the covenant of marriage, the experience should be hallowed 
meaning holy. It should be sacred to the two of you. It should be consecrated. It should be something that's revered between the two of you instead of hollow, empty, and no fulfilling. We should strive for holiness in this area of our lives, not just uh, it's something, an act that we just take on because it's something that's supposed to happen between a husband and wife. It's something that we should strive for holiness and righteousness in, not just in our lives, in the outward lives that people see, but we should strive for holiness and righteousness in our sexual intimacy, in our, our spiritual intimacy with God. Because in all things, we are to glorify God. He's the one that created it. He's the, one that, he's the one that suggested that we do it. He's the one that commanded us to be fruitful and multiply. Okay, so we are to seek holiness and righteousness in this area of life as well. And this joint holiness between a husband and wife in this area of our lives is brought about by spiritual intimacy with one another, but most importantly, with God himself. You see, most people, they become squeamish about the topic of sex. They're squeamish about it when it comes to the public uh, discussion of it, the, the, the public expression of it, and even oftentimes in private with their own mates, they have problems discussing the topic of sex. However, sex is anything but an uncomfortable topic for God. He's the one that created sex. It was his idea for man and a woman to come together in order to procreate. You have to have sex. You must have a man. You must have a woman, a woman in order to have sexual intercourse in order to procreate. God said be fruitful and multiply. And this subject about sex is such an important subject that God dedicated an entire section of Scripture towards it. Just as the Old Testament is a written or word picture, a foreshadowing, so to speak, of Christ as the Messiah, the Song of Solomon is a word picture of what the marriage relationship ought to be, both spiritually and physically. And it is flowing with all kinds of imagery on the aspects of the sexual relationship between a husband and wife. God did not scamp. He did not uh, go small in this area. He makes this, this scripture, this area of scripture full of passion. He describes it as being full of excitement. And that's because the sexual relationship between a husband and a wife is a gift from God and that's the way that we need to look at it it's a gift from God it's something that's supposed to be beautiful it's something that's supposed to be cherished it's something that's supposed to be nurtured throughout your marriage relationship it's not something that's just supposed to be nurtured in the beginning when you're in the honeymoon phase it's something that's supposed to be nurtured something that's supposed to be cherished and something that's supposed to be beautiful throughout your entire relationship Okay, it's supposed to be full of passion. Jesus and God, they're a God of passion. Jesus had passion when he went out into the streets. God has passion when it comes to his creation. God has passion in the in the song in the scripture of the Song of Solomon when it has to do with the marital relationship and the sexual relationship between a husband and wife. He said he's he's full of passion and it's supposed to be full of excitement. It's not something that's supposed to be disregarded at any time during the relationship. It's not supposed to be disregarded because the newness of it all wears off. It's not supposed to be disregarded because there are issues, because of different things, because of sickness or because of age or whatever. It is not something that's supposed to be disregarded whatsoever when it comes to a husband and wife relationship. The newness of that, that sexual relationship, the newness of that sexual and that spiritual intimacy should never wear off. And it won't as long as God is allowed into the marriage bed and made part of the physical relationship as well. Now, when I make that statement, some of you probably are beginning to cringe right now. You're beginning to say, did he really just say that? We're supposed to allow God into our marriage bed. Well, uh, of course I said that. 
Why wouldn't I say that? It's, it's a true statement. We say it all the time in church that, that you know, pastors preach it from the pulpit, that, that you know, and, and people one-on-one -on -one talk about it when we're, when we're counseling other people. We talk about it all the time. We say that God wants to be part of every area of our lives. We say that, and I'm sure that many of you out there have said that yourselves when counseling other people. God wants to be a part of every area of your life. But when it comes to the sexual area, when it comes to the more personal aspects of life, all of a sudden we, te we, we tend to begin to ease him out of the picture. We begin to, to leave him out of the bedroom. We begin to leave him out of the physical part of our relationship as if he isn't even there anymore. But he's always there. He's there when we're out there preaching the gospel. He's there when we're sitting in church with our friends. He's there when we're at work. And he's there when we crawl in bed with our spouses at night. Okay? We can't ease him out. He's always going to be there. So why not invite him to be a part of what that means? Because he created it. I'm not trying to be be kinky. I'm not trying to be nasty. I'm not trying to be uh, uh, disgusting. But God wants to be a part of every area of our life, so why not invite him in to be a part of it so it can become a hallowed act and not a hollow act in our relationship. Since God created sex and it is his wedding gift to the married couple, he most definitely wants to be a part of that in their lives. Not in a nasty way, but in a holy way. So what exactly is God's attitude towards sex? Well, incredible as it may seem, folks, God is very interested in our sex lives. For many of you, that's going to seem like a very strange idea. It's going to seem way out there. But listen to what Scripture has to say. One of the more subtle passages in the Song of Solomon, verse Five, I mean, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, reads this way. It says, I am here in my garden, my treasure, my bride. I gather my myrrh and my spices and eat my honeycomb with my honey. I drink my wine with my milk. O oh, lover and beloved, eat and drink. Yes, drink deeply of this love. Now, Obviously, when you look at the very first portion of this scripture, we see that Solomon is speaking to his bride. I am here in my garden, my treasure, my bride. Okay? I gather my myrrh with my spices and eat my honeycomb with my honey. I drink my wine with my milk. He says, he says, uh, O lover and beloved, eat and drink. Yes, drink deeply of this love. Okay, the next part there, O lover and beloved, eat and drink. Yes, drink deeply of this love. In a different translation, it views this verse differently. And some give credit to this verse towards Solomon, as if he's speaking to guests at a feast. But that really doesn't make sense to me. Others give it credit to the young women of Jerusalem. But that doesn't really make sense to me either because why would, why would the uh, people of Jerusalem, why, young women of Jerusalem, why would guests at the feast be in his love chambers? Why would it be in his honeymoon chambers with his bride? From what I've read, the original text does not contain any identifying remarks as to the identity of the speaker in this part of scripture other than basically gender. And personally, as I read this last portion of Scripture, I believe that that last portion of Scripture where it says, O oh, lover and beloved, eat and drink. Yes, drink deeply of this love. I believe that the person speaking that part of Scripture is God himself. Speaking to Solomon and to Shulamite, his bride. And, you know, it just makes sense that God would be on the scene here because God's everywhere. God called a man and a woman to come together, make two flesh become one flesh. And he, 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 he commanded that God will be on the scene, giving his approval of what's, what's happening, of what's going to happen, and telling them to immerse themselves in their passionate love for each other. 
He's encouraging them to enjoy the gift that he has given to them in their marriage covenant. And that is the gift of sexual intercourse, the gift of the ability to procreate, the ability to come together, to, to, to enjoy one another, to comfort one another. But unfortunately, society has made married sex out to be quite boring. <laughs> Uh, society looks at it a totally different way than the way that God does. Um, it's, it seems as if in society today that the only kind of sex that's exciting is illicit sex, sex outside of marriage. It's the only kind that can be exciting. They say if it feels good, do it, run around. They sleep with different partners. They have a different partner almost every night in a lot of cases. Uh, they got this whole swingers thing going on where people are swapping mates and stuff like that. You know, so it seems that that once in, in, in society's eyes, once the marriage sex gets a little bit boring, that you should start seeking it outside of that. You should start seeking illicit things in order to bring excitement back into that marriage. That once married, married, that the sex gets old, that it gets stale, it becomes unfulfilling. And like I stated before... It can get that way if we allow it to, but it doesn't have to get that way. The idea of boredom after marriage is the view that many men and women have, but it's not the way that it has to be. It's, it's sad that even many Christian men and women hold the same opinion when it comes to sex. I mean, I, I, I've, I've seen so many, I've counseled so many men and women over the years that have gotten to a place in their marriage where they say, well, sex just isn't exciting anymore. I, I've, I've, I've been with the same woman or I've been with the same man for 10 years, for 15 years, for 20 years. It's boring now. There's no excitement in it. Well, that doesn't have to be. But unfortunately, there's this idea out there. There's, there's this air out there. There's these opinions out there, views on, on sex inside of marriage that we need to break you know here are some of the common views that Lucy and I have experienced over the years when counseling many people uh, some outside the church and some many inside the church when it comes to sex you know one of the views that we've gotten before was sex is something that that, that is to be done because I have to you know um, sex is something that has to be done because I have to like it's 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 so demanding on them. They, they, they do it only because they have to. They don't really want to, but they do it because they have to because the Word of God says so. There's a view out there that says sex is something to be done because God says I have to. You know, there's other views out there that says it's a thankless chore. I've heard all these things that I'm telling you right now, Lucy and I have, as, we, as we've counseled uh, men and women in premarital uh uh, premarital counseling in, in during their marriage, marital counseling with young and old. Uh, another view out there is it requires too much effort on my part, or it requires too much effort on the other person's part, or the best thing about sex is when it's all over. <laughs> Man, I mean, I, I've actually heard these things. Here's, here's a good one. What is his problem? All he ever thinks about is sex. Maybe some of you out there can relate to some of these things I'm saying. Maybe you've even thought those things. Maybe you've even said some of these things. How about this one? What is her problem? She could care less if we ever had sex. You know, these are common views that, that people have had over the years that Lucy and I have experienced, both inside and out, outside the church when it comes to sex. Too often, people view sex in marriage as a duty and they even use scripture to further back up their arguments. Like in 1 Corinthians 7, 3 through 5, where it says, The husband should not deprive his wife of sexual intimacy, which is her right as a married woman, nor should the wife deprive her husband. The wife gives authority over her body to her husband, and the husband also gives authority over his body to his wife. So do not deprive each other of sexual relations. Many men use this as a, as a, as a way to, to force their wives or to get their wives to do something they're not willing or not ready to do. Men, let me tell you something. Yes, Scripture does say that we should not deprive the other of sexual relations. But nowhere in Scripture does it say that as a husband or as a wife that you are supposed to force your spouse into doing something that they do not want to do. They may not feel well. They may be having things going on that you don't know about. They may be dealing with issues or whatever. They may be sick. 
You know, we cannot force our spouses to do something that they're not ready or willing to do at that moment in time. God does not give us the right to do that. Yes, Scripture says that we are not deprived one or the other of, of, of that sexual relationship because our body is not our own. It belongs to our spouse when we say, I do. But nowhere does it say that we're supposed to use this Scripture or use any Scripture to get our way. That's called manipulation, and manipulation is witchcraft. Okay, witchcraft. Do not use witchcraft in your marriage to get what you want. Manipulation, all that is, is, is taking a, a situation and manipulating it for an outcome of your liking or your desiring. And when you begin to use scripture to begin to, to use that against your spouse to, for an outcome of your liking, that's called witchcraft. And that should not be so in your marriage relationship. In this scripture, in some translations in verse 3, verse 3 actually reads, Let the husband fulfill his duty to his wife, and likewise also the wife to her husband. That brings back the whole idea that people see sex as a duty, as a duty that must be done. But in the Greek, that word duty there refers to a debt. Not a favor or task to be accomplished, but a debt that is owed a responsibility a mutual responsibility one to the other okay it is an indebtedness that we have to one another through god that we are supposed to to share ourselves with our spouse not only spiritually but also physically and there's three principles that i want to explore uh, about this passage today in this message, there's three principles that we need to understand when it comes to that sexual experience, that depriving or not depriving one or the other of that sexual need. And that's the first principle, the principle of sexual need. God gave us this sexual need in our lives. God gave it to us. He doesn't say, oh, when and if you feel like it, you should satisfy your mate sexually. No, he doesn't say that. He commands that we do so. He says that we should not deprive our husbands. We should not deprive our wives because our bodies are not our own. So do not, he said, do not deprive each other of sexual relationships. That's not a suggestion. That's a commandment. It says in verse 5, not to deprive each other because sex is a gift from God. That is his gift to the married couple for their new marriage. Okay? He, he, he gives that as a gift, as is the intimacy that is brought about because of it. Yes, there's a sexual intimacy and, and, and because we invite God into that portion, there can be a spiritual intimacy as well that is built through that experience. And so is the drive behind the desire, a gift from God. God gives us that desire as a gift so we will continually satisfy one another and not deprive one another of that experience. If it were only for procreation, sex I mean, if it was only for procreation as some people think, or only for something that's to be done once in a while, then the intense desire and drive would not be there. I believe with all my heart that God has given us that sexual drive, that He has given us that desire for one another so that we could satisfy one another and that's part of ministering to one another is satisfying each other in that area why because god gave us that as a gift in our marriage to minister to one another to not deprive each other of one another in those sexual relations the second principle in this scripture that we need to discuss is the principle of authority according to verse 4 once we're married and we become one, our bodies are no longer our own, but they belong to the other. Unlike before marriage, once we say, I do, we no longer have the right to deny our bodies to our spouse. Now, that is with I say that with an understanding that we need to realize 
that we are not to deny our bodies to our spouse. We are not to deny that, that sexual relationship to our spouse. But we also need to understand that there's times when it's just not going to work out. And we are not to force the other into doing something they're not ready or willing to do. Okay, please do not get me wrong here. I am not saying that because the scripture says do not deprive, that we have the right to force our mates into doing something we want them to do. Okay, it's something that should be joint agreement. You see, our bodies are a part of the wedding gift that we give to each other and that God gives to us and they should be treated as such. They should be treated as a gift. Okay, a gift that we're going to cherish, a gift that we're going to nurture, a gift that we're going to take care of and not abuse, not take advantage of. Okay, that comes into that part of forcing the other person to do something they're not willing to do. That's taking advantage of a situation. That's taking advantage of the gift that God has given you. That's taking advantage of the gift that your spouse has given you when they said, I do. Okay, we are not to take advantage of that. We are not to treat each other. Uh, in the wrong manner, but in the right manner, we should cherish and honor that gift and treat it as a very important and, and, and blessed gift that we have received, not only from our spouse, but most importantly, from God. And the third principle that we need to look at here is the principle of faithfulness. Again, in verse 5, we're told not to deprive each other. It's like taking the gift back when we deprive the other person of what God has given us and what we're supposed to have given to our spouse. It's like taking that gift back. It's like being an Indian giver, so to speak, as we call it. Once we've given ourselves to our spouse, we have no right to take that back from our spouse. Once God has given us to our spouse, we have no right to take back what God has given Okay, part of the wedding and part of the marriage package is a God ordained sex life. Okay, it is ordained by God that a man and woman, after they get married, that they have a sexual relationship. Okay, a spouse becomes unfaithful to their vow and to God when intimate relationships are purposefully withheld. Many times we see, I've seen many times in marriage relationships where the wife withholds sex from her husband in order to have some kind of control over what he, she wants him to do and vice versa. I've seen it where men have done the same thing, but it's less likely to see men do that than it is to see women do that because a lot of times in, in a controlling relationship where the men are very controlling over their wives, the wives begin to use that as a factor where they can gain back some control, but that is not what God intended. God intended for us to give ourselves to each other to never take back and we are we are being unfaithful to the vow that we've given one another. We're being unfaithful to the vow that we, we said before God himself in this marriage covenant. When intimate relations, when sexual relations are purposefully withheld from the other person. Unfortunately, unfaithfulness on the part of one spouse in this area, the withholding of sex can often lead to unfaithfulness on the part of the other spouse in the form of extramarital sex. Folks, the Word of God says that we should not withhold from one another so that the devil cannot get a foothold in our relationship. And many times, folks, when we withhold those sexual relationships, women from their husbands or husbands from their wives, it can cause them to begin to seek that desire out because God has placed that sexual desire inside of us that begin to seek out that desire somewhere else. For men, many times, it's on the internet or in magazines in the form of pornography. But that pornography eventually ends up leading to extramarital affairs with a real human being somewhere down the line. Uh, with women, it's not so much in the pornography, though we've seen that many times. We've seen women get involved in pornography, but many times they usually skip right past that part and they begin to seek out that real flesh and blood human being that can give them what they're not receiving at home. 
It's just like a child that, that doesn't receive love from their parents and the way they expect to receive it. They go out and seek that love somewhere else. And that's why many of our young people are getting involved in, in sexual relationships outside of marriage at a very young age. They're, they're getting, uh, we see young teenage pregnancies and, and unwed mothers taking care of children that they've had out of wedlock. It's because they're not receiving the love that there's that they that they need they're not they're not receiving that 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 fulfillment so they go out and seek it somewhere else but we folks as a married couple we have an indebtedness okay to serve each other whether in bed or out of bed okay this servanthood comes in many forms and we are a servant also when it comes to our spouse in bed why because we're serving the other person's needs okay it is a privilege folks it is a responsibility that is given to us by God to fulfill this in our marriage relationship we are called to be servants to our maids and this is one way that we can we can fulfill that servanthood is by serving our mates in the marriage bed to fulfill the needs and desires that they have sexually because God has given them that God has given you that and we are called to fulfill those needs with one another through the gift that God has given through the gift that we've given to one another something God ordained strictly for married couples sex is something that is strictly ordained by God it is a gift given to men and women from God for those that have committed to the marriage covenant that marriage bond okay it is not for anyone outside of the marriage relationship if we disregard what this verse tells us okay we effectively take ourselves out of the authority of our vows to one another and out of submission to God who ordained this relationship folks if there are any of you that are listening to this right now that are looking to get married but have been in a relationship with your boyfriend been in a relationship with your girlfriend with your fiance and you have not been married and you're having sexual relations right now you are out of authority and submission to God and I say to you right now quit it stop it separate from one another okay because if you think God is going to bless your marriage after you have already stolen a gift from him that he intended only to give to you once you said I do you are sadly mistaken God will not bless unholiness God will not bless unrighteousness God will not bless your will only his will okay so I say separate until that such time that you come together before God and repent for the things that you've done outside of what his word has allowed. And then you can come together on that day that you marry, the day that you said I do, the day that you invite God into that relationship. And God will bless that from that point forward. Okay. I also, I've already spoken on this a little bit, but you also need to understand that there are times when this sexual encounter, this, this, this sexual intimacy is just not going to be convenient. It's just not. There's going to be times of sickness. There's going to be times of extreme fatigue. There's going to be times of stress. There's going to be times when schedules conflict. That you, this is just not going to be able to be fulfilled. But this is not considered to be one of those times where, where Scripture says that we are not supposed to deprive one another. Okay, that's not considered depriving one another. That's considered being understanding of one another, realizing that there's just times when we have to sacrifice what we want for the desires of the other. Okay, we need to realize that there's just times when it just can't happen. We need to be understanding of the feelings of our spouse when it comes to those times. There are ways around just outright denying each other, however, and that is like, for instance, make a date, make a date for some time in the future. 
Okay, later in the evening, maybe, or later on in the week, but not later on in the year. Let's not postpone it indefinitely. There's got to be some compromise in that situation, in that area where there's conflict, conflict sickness, whatever. Okay, you've got to compromise. Okay, when situations arise, they should be handled lovingly. Remembering that in all areas of married life, we are to minister to one another. And often, folks, you need to realize it's not the message that is the problem, but it's the delivery method that is the problem. Okay? Another very important part, another, another very important, yeah, another very important point, let's get this down, in order to have a fulfilling marriage, folks, is in all areas we must individually decide that we will put aside our own desires and serve the other and their needs and their wants. Once again, folks, it comes to the issue of ministering to our maids. It says that we must deny ourselves, take up our cross, and follow after him. He spent his entire life on this earth, okay, putting aside his desires taking up the cross of Calvary and doing what God the Father's will was instead of his own. We need to begin to live that out in our lives. The sexual relationship is also an area in which we can minister to our mates. It's not just a task to be completed and then move on. It's something that God has given us as a gift or as a means to be able to minister to our mates, to comfort our mates, to bring satisfaction to our mates. When it comes to ministering to our mates, we should be falling all over each other in an attempt to meet the needs of the other person. How many people, if they were in a marriage like that, where their husband or their wife was falling all over them, and they were falling all over their husbands or wives, trying to minister to them where they, they wouldn't feel love, they wouldn't feel needed, they wouldn't feel wanted. Folks, if more couples were falling over one another trying to serve the other person, trying to meet the needs of the other person, both would feel loved. Both would feel wanted. Both would feel needed. Okay? But that doesn't happen very often. And that really needs to change. I mean, if we look into our own relationships, we can see where there's times where we just, we, we become selfish. Okay, we become, we become desiring of what we want without the thought of what our spouse wants. You know, there's times when we're tired and we just, we demand our own way. But that's not the way that God intended it to be. Even in those times when we're tired, even in those times where, where we may not feel like doing something that, that the other wants, we've got to sacrifice what we want for the desires and the wants of our mate. Okay? None of those previous statements, however, that I read about sex... None of those statements, those previous statements, those ones back here where we were talking about sex is something to be done because I have to, or sex is something to be done because God says I have to, or it's a thankless chore, or it requires too much effort, or the best thing about sex is when it's over, or man, what is his problem? All he ever thinks about is sex, or what is her problem? She never really wants to have anything to do with sex. She she. She really cares less about sex. None of those previous statements that I read about sex lines up with God's description of married sex in the Song of Solomon. Sex should be viewed as a way to love your mate. It should be viewed as a way to minister to your mate. It should not be seen as a chore. It should not be seen as a menial task. It is a gift from God that is intended for you to give to your mate on the day that you say I do, do, on the day that you become bound by the marriage covenant, okay? Not by the day that you say I do when you are sitting in the back seat of your car or in the or in some other place with your boyfriend or your girlfriend and you just say, yes, I do want to do this because this is something I want to share with you because I love you. That's not what God intended. God intended for that to be something that you share with the one that you love because of whom loves you on the day that you become bound to into one flesh in the marriage covenant and through the marriage covenant only. It is not something to be shared outside of marriage. That is a sin. 
that is outside of God's will, and it is something that needs to be repented for and brought to the cross of Calvary. Okay? We need to realize what God thinks about sex, what God's desire was for sex in the marriage relationship, and begin to live according to that, according to His will and not our own. That's it for this week, folks. Come back next week, and I will continue our discussion on the other S word, sex and intimacy inside of marriage, and we will get further into what God's word has to say about it and what God's desire is for it in your relationship as well. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you and praise you, Lord God. I thank you, Father, for this thing called sex, for this spiritual thing called intimacy, Lord God, that we are supposed to have and we're supposed to share with our mates, with our husbands, with our wives, something that's to be cherished and something that's to be honored, something that's to be desired and accepted, something that's supposed to be given freely, Lord God. Father, we thank you for that, Lord God. We thank you for the blessing that it can be and should be in our lives and in our relationships, Lord God. Father, we thank you for what your word has to say about it. And Lord, we just pray, Father God, that we would take heed to your word, that we would begin to put this word to use in our lives, begin to seek out, Lord God, what your will is for us individually and what your will is for us as a couple, what your will is for us in our relationship with you, so that we can not only honor each other, but we can honor you in our relationships, both the physical and the spiritual, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, and amen. Go with God. He's going with you.